they told you, with your personality, with your hair, with your hijab, with your skin colour, with your preferences, with your gender. They told you, with their silence, with their words, with their resentment, with their absence. They told you, you don't belong. Yet, here, you are. I'm Michael Okacho, I'm a General Surgery Registrar and I'm the Association of Surgeons in Training, Equality and Diversity Officer. Hi, my name is Natasha Alford, I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Bristol and I'm the co-founder and co-president of the Bristol Women in Surgery Society. Hi, my name is Sam Parsons, I'm a second year medical student from Swansea University and President of Cardiovascular Society Swansea. My name is Narain Morjani and I'm a consultant cardiac surgeon at Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge. I'm the Honorary Secretary for the Society for Cardiothoracic Surgery in Great Britain Ireland and currently the Chair of the Equality and Diversity Working Group for the Society. Um, recently appointed OBE Professor Farah Bhatti read medicine at Somerville College, Oxford, before completing her clinical training at Jesus College and Addenbrooke Hospital, Cambridge. Professor Batty has resided in Swansea since 2007, working as a consultant cardiac surgeon at Morrison Hospital, as well as holding many other roles with Swansea University, Royal College of Surgeon England, SCTS, and many more. She holds many personal firsts, including the first female consultant cardiac surgeon in Wales, as well as the first female cardiac surgeon and the first ever Muslim woman to be elected as a council member for the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Welcome. Okay then. Uh, can you take us through your morning routine? Okay, on an operating day, I set my alarm for 6.25. I have my compulsory 10 minute snooze and then I start my day with a coffee in bed, um, which is brought to me and uh, check my messages, try not to get too hooked onto Twitter, but just check if there's anything important that's come through over the overnight. And I'm out of the door around about five to seven. So it's quite a quick routine. Arrive at hospital, um, if it's an operating day, the first thing really is a team brief. We've got a big team for cardiac surgery, lots of uh, people who make the show run. So we run through the list for the day and then I meet with my surgical team to go through the investigations, angiograms, make sure everyone knows what they're doing. And then it's off to my office for um, breakfast and sort of getting into the zone. And uh, before you ask what my breakfast is, it's Alpen in summer and Ready Breck in winter. And no, they don't pay me to say that. Thank you. So where did you grow up? I'm a South London girl. Um, I was born in Birmingham, uh, but my parents moved to London when I was two months old. So I've um, brought, brought up in South Norwood, which is near Croydon. So it was inner city. And uh, yeah, so a Londoner. Great, thank you. And uh, what was life like? I guess growing up, it was pretty idyllic. Um, I, we, I guess we're working class, but um, I thought we were middle class, so I didn't really know much about it, but it was great. It was the seventies, you went to the park, you played in the street, it was all quite safe. You were allowed to letter your own devices. The, we had um, every weekend would be an exciting day trip. My father had a Volkswagen, um, we, which we'd upgraded from a Morris Minor, so the um, to my brother and my sister and myself will be packed in the back. Lots of day trips to uh, places that don't even exist like Woburn Abbey, which had a safari park, Brighton Beach every Saturday or Sunday. So it's a great picnic. So lots of lots of time up in London as well. So um, I remember it really well. And, you know, it was the 70s. So 
I like Donny Osmond and David Cassidy and all, all the normal things that probably you might not have heard of, Sam. So. so why did you apply for medicine? Hmm. Um, it's tricky to answer because as far as my I can remember in my consciousness, I wanted to be a doctor. So it was almost sort of that was what I was always going to be. And I suspect it was probably a little bit to do with my father always being poorly when I was younger. And so it was never in doubt that I um, was going to be a doctor. And I guess with his illness, um, the heart sort of took on a fascination for me. So it was a doctor. I have to be honest here, Natasha, I did have a sneaky flirtation with law because I quite like the idea of being a barrister. It wasn't terribly serious. Uh, I knew it was never going to be for me, but it was a slight deviation from my path of being a doctor. That's really interesting to know. So what was medical school like for you? <clears throat> Overall, it was amazing. I, I went from being um, relative, as I said, sort of normal 70s kid but um, I'm um, a Muslim, it was quite sort of, you didn't sort of go out, you went out with your family. I was, it was sort of fairly conservative, although forward thinking. And then you're sort of let loose into a whole new world that you don't know. I mean, it was Oxford, it was so exciting. I mean, you can see I'm still sort of, you know, I, I can still uh, remember the day I was left with my half empty suitcase, a duvet and a pillow. That's all I owned when I went up to Oxford. And you get to meet and the beauty of Oxford or other places that have the college system, which I guess is a sort of a posh walls of residence, is that you get to meet people, not just in your own sort of um, um, own sort of area of study, but lots of other people, different um, nationalities, got to like, sort of tried lots of sort of societies. I even uh, did karate. I represented Oxford in the varsity games in karate, would you believe, in 1987. So I had an amazing time. Oh, and I did do a little bit of studying and pass my exams. And the best, one of the best bits of that being at Somerville was you could get up at quarter to nine and still be in the science area for a nine o'clock lecture. So really great. And then of course, Cambridge um, for clinicals was equally amazing. Yeah, so following on from that, where did you do your training? Well, I, um, I decided I wanted to be a surgeon during my clinical train, um, clinical. So the rest of my career, the whole, every single job I did was aligned to make that sort of final sort of end point. I thought it was the end point. It's sort of just the beginning of being a consultant cardiac surgeon. So I did house jobs in Cambridge. I was Prof Khan, Professor Sir Roy Khan's first female houseman and um, in fact I went to visit him um, a, um, a few months ago and um, saw him so that was nice and I went down to St Mary's to do um, demonstrating an accident and emergency back to Oxford to get six months of cardiothoracic on the CV and then two years in Bristol and Brompton, Harefield, uh, two years of research uh, in transplantation back at um, Cambridge and Papworth and finally, finally, I got a registrar job in the Northwest. So, but everything was aimed to get a registrar job and a consultant job. So all very surgical. So, um, so if you remember, what was your first week as a consultant like? Pretty weird exciting stressful i got a lovely note from somebody who'd interviewed me saying um come and see us at the university when you get your feet under the desk and i wanted to say i don't have a desk <laughs> and, and and this room that you have uh, that you see behind you is sort of it was a cupboard so i i was um uh, but no it's great here swansea is great don't get me wrong but it's a big change they talk about big life events when you you know married divorce move but I think I was probably a little bit hard on myself. I moved down from Manchester and all my sort of set up, my good friends were there and I ended up here and I thought I won't go back for three or four months and I think I sort of isolated myself but it's a big step and you don't have, if you move um, hospitals and you move cities, it, it's, a, it's a big change. So, um, so yes, it was interesting, exciting, scary all at the same time, but it's also great to get that first operation, that first week, that first month out of the way. And 13 and a half years in, I sort of think I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> what 
challenges have you faced along your journey? Wow, um, where to start, Michael? I guess, like everybody, you face challenges and some are small, but sort of little and continuous. I, I don't really feel overall that I've had many big sort of um, hurdles to pass, but looking back, you do. And I, I guess the little things are never quite getting the job or tapping, getting the tap on the shoulder or having, you know, sort of, um, what's the equivalent of nepotism these days, I suppose, cronyism, but you have to sort of work hard, probably but when people say twice as hard, you know, I do think you have to justify your position and make sure people really understand you really don't, do want to do the specialty and know you're not going to go off and do something completely different and, and you're serious about it. So I think you have to try, those are the sort of day-to-day -day challenges. There, there, are, there have been other things in my life where I've had, um, which I you know, might discuss later, but I, the usual sort of being undermined or being patron, now we have a name for it, mansplaining, but you know, that, that's not new just because somebody's coined a trendy phrase for it so all those little things but surprisingly enough I think I never really thought when I was a kid maybe I thought that being I didn't really think anything would sort of stop me doing what I wanted we were just brought up to what do whatever we wanted to so, uh, and we were good at but with hindsight you realize that actually not being a man has probably been the thing that has probably not got me to who knows where i might have been today if i was a man <laughs> i'd uh, shudder to think so 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 yeah i've had challenges and um it's just important that when you you go through anything you, you get your your friends by your side and you try and navigate around them sometimes you can't and i have sometimes bided my time just to get out of that place. But if anyone is going through stuff, reach out to other people. And, and uh, apart from people, how else have you overcome these challenges? There must be, you know, internal things that you do to, to reinforce yourself or avoid the mansplaining. <laughs> uh, yeah, sort of deep breaths, count to three, try and grit your teeth, all those, all those things. Um, as I said, I think it's really important that you have your support system around you, whatever that might be. Uh, it might be friends, it might be colleagues, because essentially, you know, when you're in the NHS, you really are, you, you're like family and not that you love everybody, but you don't in your family either, do you? But you need to have someone to talk to, someone to offload to. And then, like you mentioned, at some times in your life, you do need that sort of technique. You need to step away, you need to, you know, sort of, learn how um, to keep yourself composed and I've had to work on that uh, because my natural reaction is to call things out and um, so so yes. Perfect and thinking over your whole career is has there been a defining moment a moment in which you felt challenged and it changed the trajectory of your career can you think of a memory like that? I can think of a number of um, situations and I guess the most challenging situation if we're going to be honest is when I, I was bullied. I've been bullied quite badly a number of times but one was absolutely awful and I often when I give lectures I say to uh, my husband sometimes sits in the back of the audience if I'm waiting for him to give me a lift home and and I once said and I have never doubted I would be a surgeon and you can do it and then he said you know that he said remember the time you were weeping at the airport because you didn't want to fly back to that job where you were being bullied mm -hmm. and I went yeah so he keeps me grounded so the point is there have been terrible times where I have actually wanted to give up surgery but I don't let them be they weren't career defining for me they were periods in my life that were challenging but they do not define me the bits that define me are the bits that I man you know so I overcame them with essentially biding my time because nobody would help and I think that's why I'm so passionate about helping others because when I see something wrong doesn't matter if it's bullying or, or, or whatever I have to call it out so what I would like to say is yes I face challenges but they don't define me they didn't define my career they did not make me change my career um, I maybe had to navigate things differently but um, yep don't let the challenges define you you define yourself
had in the past um, experienced some bullying um, from surveys and studies done recently, we know it still exists. So um, from somebody who's been through that, how would you um, advise uh, students or um, aspiring surgeons about what to do in that situation and how to deal with it? Okay. First of all, um, I'm really sorry if you're going through it, but as, uh, as um, Noreen has said, the, it, it happens. I think the main thing is to make yourself safe, remove yourself if there's anything sort of physical, etc. try and make sure you remove yourself from that situation. Write things down. I, I know that sounds really trite, but write things down and then talk to somebody. You will have lots of people who will help you. You might reach out to your personal friends where you feel more comfortable talking about things, um, a partner if you have them, you know, um, family support. But talk to people at work. You need to do, uh, you need to make sure that the people who are responsible for the behaviour of others, of course, everyone's responsible for their own behaviour. But there are people within whether it's within the hospital system, whether it's within your medical schools, um, your, your research environment that you're in, who have responsibility for your well-being and to ensure that people behave well. We, you know, we have good medical practice. We have good surgical practice. So talk to people, you need to offload to somebody and then find ways where you can actually sort of restore yourself as well. And whether that means um, taking time out, talking to people, uh, just realising that it's not you, it is the other person's problem and they are projecting it onto you. And it's often, um, I'm not an expert on this, but when people feel threatened etc they lash out to to people and it's a and being bullied doesn't isn't and it doesn't say anything about you and then talking and reaching out for help is nothing negative and you'll be surprised there are a lot of people who should be helping you but there's also a lot of people who will want to help you and be there for you because in general i think people are, are good and want or want to make sure that good things um that bad things don't happen to people so that's what I'd say, talk to people, get advice, and take care of yourself. But, and thanks for asking that, Noreen, because I think it, it's so important that it shouldn't be overlooked. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Farah, um, congratulations on all your achievements. It's really great to hear the story behind all of that, and I'm sure you are gonna be an inspiration to a lot of people um, going forward. But if you could go back in time, um, what would you say to yourself to inspire or motivate yourself? I guess what I would say is I would want the person who was that determined, didn't actually, was probably quite naive. That's why I've ended up being a cardiac surgeon. I didn't know it was going to be, you know, I knew it'd be hard, but I didn't really understand all the challenges. I think I'd probably say probably to, I didn't, didn't need to motivate the younger self really because I think she was quite motivated anyway nothing was going to stop her I probably perhaps in my registrar years and in my mid-training years say be a bit kinder to yourself don't be so hard maybe be as kind when you're giving advice to somebody else and taking care of somebody else maybe do that to yourself because I think probably I'm a pretty harsh critic of myself so I don't think I would have needed any motivation but when I did encounter things like not getting a job or the red job that you had your eye on that um, that it was should have been yours but you were you know you were uh, you know you just were always picked at the post I'd say don't give up you know be kind to yourself you know let, um, you don't have to be perfect all of the time that's what I'd probably tell myself and um, it's great. Um, apart from what you told the young Farah, I'm sure you are going to be a role model to lots of medical students and inspiring surgeons moving forward. What other advice would you give them to, to, to inspire them? Um, lots of advice to give, but you're, you're going to do something where somebody's life is literally in your hands. You've got to have a passion for it. You, want, you have to want to help people. You've got to love what you do. And then when you do it, do it with love you know it's a, a lifelong affair with surgery and dealing with patients so just um, do it with love and be the best you can 